Yakuza is a series about hardship. It's a series about characters trapped in a system struggling to break free. It's about doing the right thing when the right thing seems impossible, about growing old, about forming connections and discovering what really matters in life. Of course, you wouldn't know that from any of the footage I've been using because Yakuza is also one of the most deceptive video game series in existence, a title of wild clashing tones that should not go together, but somehow do, and in the process, form something different and more. Yakuza is a contradiction, and Yakuza is beautiful. These are games filled with powerful men of strength and resolve tearing off their shirts as they howl into the night sky and slam their fists into each other's bodies in explosive clashes of will and fury, where massive underworld conspiracies threaten to consume entire cities and destroy the lives of every citizen in it. But these are also games of some of the straight up goofiest shit you've ever seen. Moments when logic and reason careen into the stratosphere and the tense melodramatic crime story melts into a bizarre Japanese life simulator, to the point that depending on what part of Yakuza you see, it could either seem like a cinematic GTA like set in Japan, or a bizarre Animal Crossing where you can kick the shit out of people. And the truth is, it's neither, and it's both, and it is absolutely worth your time and attention. And to begin to explain why, I'd first like to talk about the very particular circumstances that led to Yakuza's creation, and the man behind the games, Toshihiro Nagoshi. 2004 was a difficult year for Nagoshi, as it was for many employees at Sega. The company had been in dire straits since the disastrous surprise launch of the Sega Saturn console in 1995, and had placed all their hopes in their final console, the Sega Dreamcast, as well as its killer IP, Shenmue, a highly ambitious open world title in a time when open world titles did not exist on consoles, clocking in at a massive $47 million budget which was, at the time, the most expensive video game ever made. Shenmue would sell well, but only made up for a fraction of its cost, financially crippling Sega and leaving the company unable to compete in the increasingly hostile console market. And so Sega, the former giant who had once gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with industry deity Nintendo, ceased production of the Dreamcast and declared themselves a third-party company, their only option now being to make games for the very competitors who had put them out of the console business. This caused morale at Sega to plummet, with many staff even questioning if the company had a future in this new age of consoles. But Nagoshi, a young creative officer at Sega who had worked on titles like Daytona USA and Shenmue, saw things differently. Now that Sega were making games for other manufacturers, they could potentially sell to a much wider audience. And so, it was out drinking in Tokyo's Red Light District that the idea struck Nagoshi. What if they made a game aimed at adults that took place in the intense nightlife of Tokyo? And what if it had a level of detail and immersion that could let players lose themselves in an intimate open environment, with a deeply engaging story set in the violent world of the Yakuza? Japanese games had a complex relationship with violent and sexual content at this point. Violence against monsters and zombies was acceptable, but not against other humans. And the topic of the Yakuza was a complete no-go. Which is why upon pitching the idea to the higher-ups at Sega, Nagoshi was met with immediate pushback and rejection. The idea was too violent, the themes were too adult, it wouldn't sell to children, and it was too Japanese to sell overseas. But Nagoshi would not relent. He saw real potential here. He believed in his vision and wanted to use the more adult themes of the game to draw in a new, much wider audience for Sega, and then engage that audience with a much more sincere and heartfelt story than anything the company had attempted in the past. And so the day finally came when Nagoshi stood in front of Sega's upper management and declared that if Yakuza was not a success, he'd resign from the company never to return. I bring this up because I think it's interesting that a series about passionate men trapped in difficult situations did itself come from a passionate man trapped in a difficult situation. And also because it shows one other thing. Nagoshi is Yakuza. And I don't just say that because he looks and dresses like a character that could appear in his games. 
This man has been the beating heart of the series for 13 years, through seven mainline games, seven spin-offs, and two remakes. And after going through enough interviews with him, you can begin to see how his worldview and personality has bled into these games and shaped what Yakuza has become. And one of the most prominent ways that this has happened is in Yakuza's approach to open world gaming. Open world games, and specifically open world crime games, have been one of the most lucrative genres in gaming for years, and it's easy to see why. The fantasy of being let loose in a city and doing whatever you want unrestrained by law or reality is a powerful one, with many open world games allowing players to rampage through its streets, robbing cars, shooting police, and causing cathartic mayhem. And what immediately stands out about Yakuza's open world is that it doesn't actually have that option. The option to commit mayhem just isn't there. Despite the fact that you play as a criminal, you can't attack people or commit crime. And this is something Nagoshi actually commented on in a lecture at Otome University in which he was referring to the GTA series. I simply can't bring myself to promote the emotion that killing is fun, that committing crime is fun. And what I find so interesting about this is that by eliminating the way a lot of games let us interact with their open worlds through violence, it forces us to view the world of Yakuza in an entirely different way. You're not God here, you're just another person, which forces you to engage with the city like you would if you were actually there. And the reason this is a positive as opposed to a limitation is the very particular design of Camaro Ocho itself. In a lot of open world games, the focus is on size, large open environments that stretch on seemingly forever. But Camera Ocho is different. Camera Ocho stretches out for no more than a few city blocks. But the key here isn't Camera Ocho's size, it's its density. Rather than having a massive world filled with empty space, every corner of Camera Ocho feels defined and realized. And these locations are filled with different activities and distractions that make the city feel dense and alive. I've spent hours wandering around this town, completely ignoring the game's mainline story and just getting wasted in bars or going bowling or hanging out at the batting cages. I know that side activities are kind of a given when it comes to open world games, but trust me, Yakuza is different. It feels like there's so much love and consideration gone into each sub-activity and side quest. For example, check out something that happens when I was exploring the seaside town of Onomichi in Yakuza 6. And by pure chance, I wandered down to the pier and got talking to this cool little fishing girl, which in turn led to a side story about their family business, which in turn ended up unlocking an entire full-blown new game mode, with new art assets, new gameplay mechanics, new environmental design, cutscenes and boss fights, including this giant squid, which I shit you not, had his own theme music. And if I hadn't wandered down to the pier, I could have completely missed this part of the game, like I did in Yakuza 0 when only after finishing it did I discover that there was an entire sub-game built around pocket stock car racing, with its own gameplay mechanics, progression systems, customization features, and storyline. And there are multiple of these layered, intricate sub-games per title, like Yakuza Zero's host club side quest with an entire game built around owning and operating a successful host club, or the dojo management sim from Yakuza 4, or the fishing from Yakuza 3, or the baseball side activity of Yakuza 6, in which Kiryu has to scout and manage an entire baseball team that essentially turns the story of Yakuza into a shonen sports anime. It's also through these side activities that the game's personality really starts to shine. Everything in Yakuza's world has this overblown, overdramatic, bombastic quality to it. Even something as minor as Kiryu picking up a telephone becomes this big, extravagant show of will. Like, seriously, check this out. Mush, mush. Yakuza revels in the irreverence. It delights in depicting serious men in ridiculous situations. What all this combines into is an open world that is at once immersive and hilarious. You never really know what you're going to see on the streets of Kamurocho, and that's kind of the joy of it. And it's fun, and it's weird, and it's exciting. But it also serves another purpose, and that's how the game's open world is used to flesh out its main character, Kiryu Kazuma. 
Kiryu is known as the Dragon of Dojima, a respected and feared high-ranking member of the Yakuza, his stoic icy demeanor being surpassed only by his fiery ferocity in combat. And that's the fun of playing as Kiryu. He is a fantasy, a respected, powerful, very attractive fantasy. And the game's combat does a great job of making you feel like that. Combat occurs either randomly out in the open world or in the game's more linear story sections. And while the fighting isn't especially deep, it does capture the feeling of being a legitimate Yakuza badass, as you take on scores of foes while building up meter and obliterating enemies with Kiryu's creative and brutal heat actions. This combined with how he's framed in the story makes Kiryu feel like this indestructible Yakuza demon. And the final aspect of Yakuza's open world I'd like to talk about is how it takes that demon and makes him feel human. By eliminating the ability to cause violence and mayhem, the game ends up sidestepping one of open world gaming's biggest problems. A lot of open world games want to give us as much freedom as possible, while also asking us to empathise with its protagonist and story. Which is a problem if in between story sequences we're using that same character avatar to run down pedestrians which creates this immersion-breaking separation between the player's actions and the game's narrative. But in Yakuza, that separation doesn't exist. While Kiryu will defend himself if attacked, he would never attack an innocent person, therefore that option is not available to us. But this also means that every action we can take is in turn something Kiryu would actually do. And it's here we start to see a very different side of the Dragon of Dojima. Kiryu is this indestructible Yakuza badass, but he's also someone who just likes to relax in his local cat cafe, who gets way too into stock car racing, enjoys a passionate round of karaoke, and who hangs out in chat rooms while typing like an idiot. But where the game takes this further is in its mini sub-stories, in which Kiryu meets one of the city's usually pretty strange inhabitants and helps them with some personal issue they face. And rather than just feeling like standard side quests, these are actually a lot of fun. Either playing up Kiryu's awkwardness by dropping him in an uncomfortable situation, or just being genuinely heartfelt. And it's through these activities we get to know the goofier, more intimate side of the hardened Yakuza legend. And it humanizes Kiryu in a way that only video games can really do, as by exploring and engaging in Yakuza's open world, you're coming to know the subtleties of Kiryu's personality. The other advantage of this is that when we do actually engage with the game's story, we're already invested because we already care about Kiryu. Most of the plots of the Yakuza games follow the same basic formula. Kiryu, or one of the other series protagonists, becomes involved in some massive Yakuza conspiracy over either land, money, or in several cases, a small child. And from here, we watch them punch their way through entire buildings of enemy Yakuza, usually culminating in a scene where two men derobe and wrestle until one stops being evil. The quality of the plots varies a lot from game to game, but one thing that stays consistent is the level of visual presentation. The Yakuza games, and specifically their cutscenes, are gorgeous. Even on older hardware, everything from the character models to the facial animation to the camera work and lighting are leveraged to convey a palpable sense of tension and emotion. For example, check out this scene from Yakuza 6, where Kiryu meets new character, Somiya. And watch how much drama the game squeezes from this brief exchange, and how much it says about their relationship, conveyed purely through editing, shot composition, and sound design. This scene shows something else also that's core to this series, and that is the conflict that forms between Kiryu and the other members of the Yakuza. And that's a conflict rooted deep in Kiryu as a character. What I think is so interesting about Kiryu as a protagonist of these games specifically is that the same philosophy that drives the gameplay of Yakuza's open world is also what drives Kiryu as a character. And if the idea of being opposed to crime and murder sounds like a conflict of interest for a professional criminal Yakuza, oh boy is it. 
There is in Japan this super romantic idea of what being a Yakuza is. Despite the fact that they are a known criminal organization, public opinion on the Yakuza is mixed, with many people seeing them as criminals who keep crime clean, who keep more volatile groups like the Chinese triads in check. And a big part of this is down to the Yakuza's own efforts. They frequently try and position themselves as a positive to Japanese society, doing things like contributing to the relief effort in Japan in times of crisis, as they did in the 2011 triple meltdown of the Fukushima power plants, or the 1995 Kobe earthquake. Actions like this mean it's very easy to get a romanticized view of the Yakuza, to see them as modern day outlaw samurais, whose means may be questionable but ultimately have Japan's best interest at heart. This is the traditional idealized view of the Yakuza, and this view is shared by Kiryu. To him, being a Yakuza means being strong enough to stand outside society's laws and forge your own path through life, and having the will and conviction to do what only you believe is right. The problem with this ideology, though, can be revealed with a quick Wikipedia search. The Yakuza have been involved in everything from human trafficking to dogfighting to high-level government corruption to even open gang warfare that spilled onto the streets of Tokyo with innocent lives lost in the crossfire. This is the violent reality of the Yakuza. And it's that violence that is embodied by many of the characters surrounding Kiryu. Kiryu is at heart a good person, but he's part of an organization that surrounds him with evil people. Every character in Yakuza has their own distinctive worldview and philosophy on what it means to be a Yakuza, and it's these ideologies that drive Yakuza's more brutal encounters and what keeps these conflicts so interesting. I want to return to Somia for a moment. If that cutscene from earlier wasn't indication enough, there comes a point in the story where Somia and Kiryu have a showdown. Showdowns in Yakuza tend to coincide with the major beats of the story, and are usually preceded by both characters ripping off their suit jackets and bearing their tattoos before beating the living soul out of one another. And the tattoos specifically are important. These are the physical embodiment of what it is to be a Yakuza to these characters, with each carrying personal significance to the character that bears them. Like take Kiryu's dragon for example. The dragon is the undefeatable lord of the heavens, expressing his own strength and commitment to his own freedom. Or Nishiki's koi, the fish of legend that swims up the waterfall in order to one day become a dragon, marking his desire to surpass Kiryu. These are the marks of the Yakuza way of life and the ultimate dedication to its values. Which is why it's so shocking when Somia does not have one. He sees the tattoos as an outdated practice of a bygone era, and he is the cold new generation of Yakuza, divorced from the idea of tradition and honor focused only on acquiring power. This frames the ensuing battle between the two as less a straight up fist fight and more a clash of ideologies. Even completely divorced from the plot, you can see how these two characters would take issue with each other. With Kiryu's idealized version of what it means to be a Yakuza, against Somia's cold, emotionless reality of what being a modern-day Yakuza actually is. It's setups like this that gives these violent brawls a real emotional weight, as each character struggles to prove their resolve and justify their own way of living through sheer physical force. And they're brutal and they're exciting, but there's also a kind of sadness to them too, and one that grows more prominent as the games go on. Later on in Yakuza, the constant fighting starts to take its toll on Kiryu, who eventually becomes disillusioned with his underworld lifestyle and decides to walk away and start a new peaceful existence with his adoptive daughter, Haruka. But there's an issue there. Kiryu can't help himself. To him, being a Yakuza is something you're born as and not something you become, and he just doesn't fit into any other corner of society. And so over and over he gets drawn back into these conflicts, trapped between his former life as a Yakuza and his desire to live a peaceful existence with his family. And this is the struggle that plays out over the course of the series. I feel like at this point it's worth noting that we've gone from talking about goofy octopus hunting hijinks to a story where broken people repeatedly crash into each other in a failed attempt to make progress. Yakuza is tragic and hilarious, but life is tragic and hilarious. 
And it's when these two sides begin to bleed together that the games start to form something earnest and more. I want to talk about a moment from Yakuza 0 that really hammered this home for me. It's the point in the story where Kiryu has gotten himself into a lot of trouble. To the point that his best friend and former Yakuza running buddy Nishiki takes Kiryu on a car ride so the two can escape Kamura Ocho and let the heat die down. Nishiki and Kiryu grew up in the same orphanage and have become kind of brothers to each other. And throughout Zero, you've explored the town with Nishiki, you've gone drinking with him, he's helped you pick out suits, and for a while, the two friends just drive in a comfortable silence. Until they stop at, well, nowhere. Kiryu gets out of the car and Nishiki offers him a cigarette, which Kiryu takes a slow, steady inhale of, before finally asking Nishiki what exactly he's doing. And Nishiki, through tears, tells Kiryu that this is the kindest, most painless end Kiryu could hope to meet at this point. Nishiki doesn't want to kill Kiryu, but he also knows the far more sadistic end Kiryu will meet at the hands of the lieutenants. And it's a real heartbreaker of a scene, delivered with all the mood and weight these games are so adept at. But as I was watching it, all I could think about was this really stupid moment from earlier in the game, when Nishiki and Kiryu were singing this dumb karaoke track and the whole scene transformed into this 80s hair metal style music video, and how fun and weird and silly it seemed at the time, and how now in hindsight that moment feels nearly obscenely tragic. How the reality of who they are and what they do has caught up with them, and it feels real and weird and sad. And it's a moment that sums up why I love these games. By taking joy in the little moments and letting us just get to know these characters through its silly open worlds and side quests, it makes the journey they ultimately go on and the hardships they face feel oddly real and human. And I think that's really cool. I think that's something to be celebrated. I hope if I've done my job right here, you're at least a little intrigued about this series, which games to play and where you should start. But the truth is, I think all this series is worth playing. Maybe not one after the other, unless you have 300 hours to kill. But if you need a place to start, I'd really recommend Yakuza 0. The game is a prequel taking place 20 years before the events of Yakuza 1, and it has arguably the best story, combat, and gameplay systems out of any of the games. But possibly its biggest selling point is its second playable character, Goro Majima. Majima is Kiryu's psychotic and dangerous rival, eventually turned ally of the series, and he's this kind of fascinating wildcard in the world of Yakuza, the total opposite of Kiryu in nearly every respect. And so imagine my shock when the opening of Yakuza 0 depicts my eye-patched brethren as a diligent, buttoned-up manager of a successful cabaret club and watching the waterfalls of shit he has to wade through over the course of the game, and how it gradually transforms him into the feared mad dog of Shimano he becomes for the rest of the series. In a weirdly powerful and sad story about just living life on your own terms, and being who you've gotta be. One that had me weeping like a small weak child by the time the credits rolled. The other advantage of starting at zero is that this will also position you perfectly at the start of Kiryu's story, and from here you can watch him go from a young, inexperienced Yakuza thug in a cheap suit, to the legendary Dragon of Dojima, to just a man trying to outrun his past and struggling to start again, in a story that spans 7 games and 30 years over the course of which it never stops feeling like it has something to say. In a narrative that shows life at its most small scale and silly, as well as its most brutal and tragic. And the oddly human feeling that comes when those two worlds overlap. And I think something that unique and special could only come from a single passionate vision. Which is why I'm so glad that Nagoshi fought through Sega's Dark Age and made his vision a reality. And, of course, why you should play Yakuza. Hey, 
Thanks for watching the video. I really hope you had a good time. Um, I got a little announcement, and that is that I'm going to be a special guest at this year's Con Bravo in Toronto. So if you're in the area, do come on down, and we'll do photos and signings, and it'll be a good time. I want to give a huge shout out to the Wolfpack over on Patreon. Once again, I love you guys, and thank you for letting me do things like this. And this week especially, I'd like to thank Hunter K. Jallo, Austin J. Dubby, The Broletariat, Jay Roos, Warlord Squirrel, Aki Dearest, Samurai Sushi, and Robokai drank a beer once. If you'd like to hear me talk more about Yakuza, you can do so over on the Let's Fight a Boss video game podcast, or you can come find me on Twitter at iPatchWolf. Friends, as always, take care of yourselves, and I'll see you next time.